so I think it might be nice to just start with a chant um, and uh, if you know it you could join in at home or if you don't you could just listen just a short chant to begin Arahang Samma Sambudho Bhagawa Udhang Bhagawan Thang Abhiwa Devi Swakato Bhagavata Dhammo Dhammang Namasami Supati Panno Bhagavato Savaka Sangho Sanghang Namami And if you'd like to um, just sit comfortably, uh, don't, don't bother rearranging position. We'll just have a couple of minutes where you can just come into contact with the body and the breath. And just be aware of the substantiality of the body, the substance, the stuff of the body, the weight of it on the chair. Contact with the, the ground, perhaps. Just be aware of the, the feeling. Feeling of the body. Maybe some parts are a little bit painful. Some parts may feel quite good. General feeling tone in the mind. And then just be aware of the activity of the mind. Thoughts, ideas that may be coming in or may not. Wishes, desires. General quality of the mind. Not to do anything with it, just to be aware of it. And then if you open your eyes, just look around you. Just take in where you are. <laughs> kind of strange talking to all these people where I am. <laughs> and I can hear the birds outside as well. <laughs> feel the chair. So, um, when I was invited to give a talk, um, this thought popped into mind, talk about the path of purification. Uh, partly because um, uh, Tina and I did a course at Green Street last year about this. I'd done a lot of looking into it. But actually, I realized that uh, this, this, theme, this theme uh, has been with me, um, really, since I first started the practice. Um, as Veronica so kindly pointed out, I, I started in the, uh, in the age before the internet, uh, where you couldn't go to Mr. Google to find out the answer to everything. And uh, 
but I don't remember there being very many books around. I think before I started practice, I'd uh, I managed to find a copy of the Dhammapada, and uh, I also came across a book by Christmas Humphreys, which had encouraged me to try and meditate. And I tried to teach myself to meditate from the book, and didn't get very far with that. Uh, but very fortunately, came across um, Samatha classes. I'm very pleased to see my my first teacher sitting in the audience here. It's rather nice to, to see him here. Um, but um, I remember quite early on, somebody mentioned about a book that was a meditation manual. And I thought, oh, that sounds interesting. Um, called The Path of Purification, the Visuddhimagga. Um, and um, I couldn't find it anywhere. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't know where to get hold of it. Uh, I couldn't seem to find anywhere in Manchester. Uh, but I think quite early on in my practice career, I'd sort of ended up going down to London and uh, in London went to a more specialist bookshop and found this book. In fact, I found this book. Here it is. Uh, those of you that uh, are familiar with it will uh, recognise it. Maybe a different colour to yours, but uh, otherwise much the same. Those of you that don't know it will probably also get the clear impression this is quite a big book <laughs> um, if you were looking for a, a quick summary of meditation practice this is not the place to go um, it's I, I, I got a copy and uh, kind of eagerly went to look in the copy and uh, I was I was completely lost uh, the first verse in there talks about disentangling the tangle but this is the aim of this book. It's teaching you how to disentangle the tangle. And then it goes into the most convoluted style and ways of describing things. And it seemed to lead me into more and more of a tangle. And uh, uh, it was quite interesting. I, I managed to find bits in there which seemed to be talking about our Samatha practice, which was quite interesting. There's a section where they talk about uh, counting and then instead of following they talk about connecting and then touching and then fixing and then they give you some more stages as well so you know it's quite an interesting uh, quite an interesting uh, uh, sort of section of the book but the, the book itself was heavy going most of it I couldn't I couldn't understand I couldn't understand the language I couldn't understand why there was so much going on in it but um, it's interestingly, it is a book that I've come back to time and time again. It's a book that I've used as a reference book uh, and found incredibly useful. Um, it's often referenced by other people who are writing about Dhamma, writing about Buddhism. It, it's regularly used because I think it was... Uh, possibly one of one of the first attempts to kind of summarize the Buddha's teaching and put it into a context related to practice. Um, it's uh, written by um, someone called Buddha Gosa and uh, I've sort of delved a little bit into the history. He wrote it in uh, about the fifth century uh, and there's all sorts of politics to do with why the, the path of purification was written. Uh, and I, this is not the place to go into that. Anyone who's interested in early Buddhist history will find it quite fascinating, actually. But uh, I'm not going to go into that now. Um, but just before I, I kind of get going on anything else, I'll just show you what the outline of the book is because the uh, the book sets out the path of purification in seven stages uh, so I'm going to have a go at screen sharing here and hopefully that will come up for you we have a thumbs up if you can see that yep good okay so um, just out of interest, before we get going, I, I was looking at this word visuddhi, 
uh, which is the, the beginning of the, Visu, the Visuddhi Magga, the path of purification. Translated as purification, but when you look in the dictionary, there are all sorts of other translations for Visuddhi. And uh, I rather like some of these other translations. And uh, the purification sounds a little bit worthy, you know, but brightness sounds, sounds quite cheerful, doesn't it? Quite good. Or, or splendor excellence and so i i thought it was worthwhile just mentioning these and i've actually pinched one of these uh, hopefully this will move on uh, because i i've sort of liberally uh, translated this word visuddhi as brightening so i've called it the seven stages of brightening and so the book sets out these seven stages uh, beginning at the bottom of this list the brightening of virtue of sila and the brightening of chitta which are, is usually translated as consciousness and then these other ones brightening of view brightening by overcoming doubt knowing and seeing what is path what is not path knowing and seeing the path and knowing and seeing so this is the model that is used throughout the book and I, I thought, oh, there must be other references in the uh, Buddhist teachings to do with this. And I sort of looked around. And actually, I could only come across one other clear reference to these seven stages. And that is in a sutta, in the middle length sayings. It's called the uh, Ratavinita Sutta, number 24, if anybody wants to look it up. Uh, I'll just take this off for a minute, maybe come back to it later. Um, and it's sometimes translated as the relay chariots or the relay of chariots. And in the sutta, it's actually a, a sutta where Sariputta goes to visit another teacher, uh, a very well-respected, very advanced teacher. And um, Sariputta sits down and begins conversation with him and then actually asks him about these seven stages. So it, it's, there's a sort of sense that there, this was some kind of model that was there because Sariputta and the other teacher uh, seem to know what they're talking about. Uh, and it goes something like this. So um, Sariputta, uh, asks the teacher, is it for the purification of sila that the holy life is lived? And he does that with all the other stages as well. And the answer every time is, no friend. <laughs> and so Sariputta turns to him and said, well, if it's not for purifying all of these things, what is the holy life for and he says it is for the sake of final nibbana without clinging and so sariputta then asks him is purification of sila final nibbana without clinging no friend <laughs> and he goes through all the others and so he said well if none of these are final nibbana without clinging, then how should the meaning be regarded? How should the meaning of these seven stages be regarded? And this is when the teacher then gives him uh, a simile and says it's like somebody who's trying to get from Sarvati to, or maybe he was trying to get to Sarvati, I can't remember the detail, but he was going from one place to another. It's a long journey. And he said, it's like having seven chariots and you have to go through by the first chariot and then you leave that one, you get into the next chariot, leave that one, get into the next chariot and so on. And th by going through these seven stages, you then reach your destination. Um, all well and good. None of, none of the individual stages are the path, but all of them are necessary for the path. But 
I think it kind of, this view, which I think comes over in the book as well, uh, leads to a misconception, which I certainly held for quite a long time. And that was about how practice develops. Because I think it's still possibly quite a commonly held view that people should purify their conduct, concentrate on getting your conduct right, before you begin trying to purify the mind, brighten the mind. And then once you've done that, then you move on to brightening and purifying your understanding. But I think it's taken me a long time of looking at this and also checking with my own experience to realize that this is not the way to regard the path of purification. The path of purification is setting out all the necessary stages, but the stages of the path are not linear. We all, we all know this, because all of us have started off um, really with the second stage, haven't we? We started off by trying to purify the mind. Yeah? That was probably how most of us came to practice. And I think I would certainly hold my hand up and say that I certainly hadn't purified Sila, still a work in progress. Uh, but I wouldn't say that development of practice isn't possible. It is still possible. You can go so far. Maybe there are times where you come across actually some of my behaviours are actually getting in the way of practice and maybe I need to change the way I behave. And you go back and look at that. But equally, as you go along, understanding develops along the way and, and we start dipping into what look like further stages along the path. And so that it, this is not talking about something linear. Um, I don't, I haven't got an alternative model. Um, some people talk about it being circular or spiral or something like that. But, um, you know, I think part of what I'm talking about here is about relating theory with experience, relating theory and practice. And we need to look at our own experience in order to uh, sometimes understand the theory. Yeah? So, um, just going back to the stages. Um, there they are. So these were like the seven, the seven stages, the relay of chariots. But I think if we think that we've got to get this one sorted first, then it's, this could be a very long, very long path. But I think it's quite clear that if you're going to get to the end of the path, all of these, all of them, need to be sorted. They all need to be dealt with. They, you, you need to go through that stage. Uh, if you think that just by developing samatha, then the whole of the path will be completed, that may not be right. If you're a vipassana practitioner and think, oh, samatha isn't necessary, that may not be right. If you think, oh, if I just, if I just behave myself well, <laughs> maybe that's not right. It's a combination of all these that's necessary. So that's the, um, the main sections of the book. But actually, uh, it's, it's split into three sections. And that, that sevenfold path that's set out is actually split into three main stages. Uh, this is uh, the first one is Sila, which is the first purification. And the first section of the book is about that. I put in these, these little quotes here 
<clears throat> well, they're not exactly, but again, they're sort of liberal quotes. The Stairway to Heaven was uh, thrown in for the old Led Zeppelin fans who I thought might might like that. Um, but uh, I think uh, the way it's actually set down in the book, I don't know whether I've got it handy here. Uh, it, in the book it says, where can such another stair be found that climbs as virtue does to heaven? And, or yet another door that gives on to the city of Nibbana. So it's making clear that this is important. You can't ignore Sila. You have to you have to come back and look at conduct and it needs to be purified it needs to be brightened i guess you know what what does that mean it means that you're removing the dirt you're removing the defilements things have to be cleared away has to be cleared away uh, the second section of the book is about samadhi it's and it's entirely about the second purification and interestingly when you look at this sort of 800 plus book, uh, nearly half of it is dedicated to samadhi. And Buddha Gosa has, let's say, a rather, ra sometimes a rather long-winded way of putting things. But one of the things he said is uh, purification of consciousness is brought about through concentration. What is concentration? And he gives a very clear and simple definition. It's the profitable unification of mind. And <clears throat> there was another expression they use, which I don't know if I have it handy. It's, uh, uh, it's the centering of consciousness and mental states that arise with it evenly and rightly on a single subject. So that's in a nutshell how you purify the mind. It then goes into detail. One of the reasons it is so long is because he describes all the 40 kamatanas that are given in the Buddha's teaching. Uh, he starts off using uh, the earth kasina as a model for developing jhana. He goes into all the other kasinas, into the recollections, the Brahma Vihara. So they're all given in great detail. Um, one of the reasons why I found it so difficult to read this book <laughs> when, uh, when I first started, it isn't something you can just sit down and read from cover to cover, or I certainly couldn't anyway. But um, if you're interested in any of those things, it is very interesting to go back and look at some of the detail because he does give some guidance on all sorts of different kinds of practice, including breathing mindfulness and, and our practice, as I mentioned. So um, that is the second section and the bulk of the book. And then the last part, he devotes to panya, the development of panya. And again, the nutshell definition, panya, he translates as understanding and says, what is understanding? It is insight, knowledge, associated with profitable consciousness. So in other words, when the mind has been profitably unified, knowledge can arise, and that is panya. Yeah? But then he splits the remainder of the book into two sections. And I think this is another interesting element of uh, this path. The first section, which again is quite a long section, it's actually, it is longer than the final section, which includes all the, the, the final five purifications, is called the soil in which understanding grows. And I thought I would uh, put up another slide to show what this is about. He's basically used uh, an analogy uh, where he says that um, Sila and samadhi are like the roots of a tree and that if the tree is to be 
strong and well rooted, well grounded. It has to have good, strong roots. But then you need to pay attention. And any, anybody who's been involved in gardening at all, and I'm sure a lot of us have during lockdown, um, knows that the soil needs to be right. You need to feed the soil. And I think the key words here are learning and questioning. So the next section that he puts in, which is the beginning of understanding, is about learning and questioning. And in this case, the learning and questioning, he gives various uh, topics that should be explored. And these are the ones that are here, the aggregates, the bases, the elements, the faculties, the truths, and dependent origination. The first four of those are essentially looking at uh, mind and body. Uh, there are one or two other things in there, but they're, they're exploring He's suggesting that you explore and investigate how this mind works, how this body works, what's the relationship between them. Um, I don't think, uh, although this is given in the book, I don't, I don't think this is an exhaustive list uh, and is perhaps pointing in a particular direction, particularly towards the development of Panya and the five later purifications but a lot of it is to do with investigating looking at theory trying to understand trying to make sense of these things not about having insight into them but just finding out about them uh, which i think is quite an important stage in the path uh, for some people, this may be more important for them than the development of samatha, development of samadhi. Because the Buddha, the Buddha teaches that people, people have different paths. Some people have samadhi leading to panya, others have panya leading to samadhi. And so for some people, I think you could say a way of putting it would be to say that if you're going to settle the mind and quieten the mind, you need to understand what you're doing. It's a bit like you have to have a framework before you can do that. Other people will more naturally be able to settle the mind and then can turn that settled mind towards understanding. But I think this stage in particular is, is very interesting uh, because for some of us, I think, I think it's important, it's very important that we do this. I think it's probably important for everybody to do this, but for some more important than others. Um, so it's interesting that that's drawn out in this book. This is not something that comes up in the Sutta. This is something that Buddha Gosa uh, introduces in this description that he gives. Uh, he also mentions that what also, also should be explored is the truth. The truths need to be explored. You need to learn about them. You need to question about them. You need to investigate them. You need to understand them. And also how things come into being. I don't particularly intend to talk about any of these, but I think it's worthwhile just sort of stressing the importance of this stage. We, we had a very good talk on dependent origination uh, a couple of weeks ago. So if anyone's interested in that and missed the talks, then worthwhile going back to have a look. But then the next thing he goes on to is uh, the last five stages which in this case I've called the brightening of Panya. And I've given a summary of them here, uh, the last five purifications. Having 
as it were, fed the soil and working on the roots, then something is able to grow. Yeah? For the completion of the path, something needs to grow. Uh, the first purification that's mentioned is the purification of view, the brightening of view, which is defined really as the correct seeing of Nama Rupa. Uh, Nama Rupa, uh, for anybody who's not familiar with that expression, is sometimes translated as name and form, mind and matter. Uh, it's to do with this. <laughs> this is a tangle, if you like, of nama, uh, mind, ideas, feelings, and rupa, materiality. And that if we're going to complete the path, we need to have some understanding of which is which. Now, I think that anybody who perseveres with the samatha practice begins to do this i think it's i think it's impossible really to do samatha practice without developing vipassana in some way without developing panya uh, just simply the fact that when we have practiced we get ideas about it it's like we formulate our own ideas our own theories about what is going on in practice um, and those are mental phenomena yeah they have an influence on the body we need to we need to be able to understand this uh, and I think it's, although we, we all develop our own theories of what's going on in practice, I think it's very useful to actually go back and see what the teachings say about these. So that investigation of Nama and Rupa that was going on in the previous stage, the soil in which understanding grows, the investigating part, you could say this is the fruition, the purification of view is the fruition of that having a clear clear seeing of what is mind what is body yeah and not confusing the two the next purification of panya is uh, i've put here getting through doubt overcoming doubt uh, and this is to do with discerning what brings about nama rupa where does this mind and body come from not necessarily in the sense of the first origin but in the sense of what's going you could say what's going on now why is that going on why is that happening why am i thinking like this why do i feel like this it's it's being able to go back and uh, again, dependent origination is mentioned very clearly here. Uh, and a bit like that uh, last stage, the, the soil was about learning and questioning and thinking about and kind of getting the theory right. I think this is talking about the experience of that. And sometimes... Maybe people have had the experience in practice where something pops up. Maybe something from the past pops up. You suddenly, you know, it may be an image, it may be a memory, it may be a, an idea. Something just pops up from the past and connects with what is present. There may, maybe, you know, you see how you did something as a child, which is you're still doing now. Yeah, there's something that's still there. Yeah, this you're kind of going back to an origin, and I and I think perhaps this is what this stage is is looking at. You could say that these two as well are looking at uh, the first two truths. They are beginning to see 
in experience the first noble truth of suffering and the second noble truth of the origin of suffering and these insights which if you remember I was saying are things that kind of keep coming round they're things that may occur for us in the middle of our samadhi practice we may think we're sitting there that we're practicing samadhi and something pops up and it and we and we can go to these things it's not something further down the path it's something that may something may happen very early on maybe that was what brought you to practice in the first place was seeing something like this you see something of that truth and that's what made you want to learn to settle the mind so this is an integral part people always used to say to me that this is a samatha vipassana path we call it samatha but it's samatha vipassana and like a lot of things i used to scratch my head and wonder what they were talking about really but i think this sort of makes sense in some way these first two purifications, uh, interestingly, are, um, no, I, I'll, I'll leave that for the moment. I'll just, I'll come back to that in a minute. I'll just go through the others. Um, the next one, knowing and seeing what is path and what is not path. Now, actually, I will mention what I was going to say, that the first two, uh, in the uh, in the Visuddhimagga, in the book, um, Buddha Gosa talks about them as young insight, tender insight. It even makes a reference to something called lesser stream entry. So this, this kind of seeing of what this is and how it comes into being, even in small ways, is a tender insight it's a young insight to develop panya further you need to go to the next stage knowing and seeing what is path and what is not path i mentioned tender insight here because at this stage it's beginning to look and see something of the three signs Anicca, Dukkha, Anatta, impermanence, suffering, no self. In particular, uh, I think it's referring to uh, Anicca. It's something about noticing how things come and go. And again, I think for anybody who practices Samatha, you must have noticed how things come and go. Hard to hard to avoid that really things do come and go we're sitting there in the practice we maybe find some really pleasant peaceful state and then it's, it's gone you know something popped into mind whatever it's it's just gone or we can be sitting there feeling dull and sleepy ready to nod off wondering whether to pack it all in and just go and lie down and then all of a sudden it just wakes up things change things come and they go and this purification this brightening refers to that but interestingly it, it also has these things the ten imperfections the ten imperfections of, or sometimes in the book they're called the defilements of insight and I'm going to show you another slide which shows you what the defilements of insight are. Here they are. Illumination, knowledge, rapturous happiness, tranquility, bliss, resolve, exertion, energy, assurance, equanimity, and attachment. The imperfections of insight. I don't know about you, but I look at those and think, yeah, I wouldn't mind. <laughs> I wouldn't mind having those. <laughs> why, 
why are these imperfections? Why are they defilements of insight? When you look back in at what it says in the book, the way this is described, um, it, it does make clear these are not defilements. These are not bad things. These are not things to avoid, things to escape from, unless you wish to develop the whole of the path. If you want to develop the whole of the path, if you want liberation, then just beware, particularly of this one, because the only one that looks obviously unskillful there is attachment. And attachment, uh, it's actually the same word that's used in reference to jhana and about moving from one jhana to the next. That there's uh, this thing called nikanti, which holds you back. You get rather attached. You like it a little bit too much. And so it becomes an obstacle to moving on. So the 10 imperfections of insight, I think, are referring to that. That sometimes the happiness, the bliss, the joy, the energy, the knowledge that comes, how we sometimes just know things, these things become obstacles on the path. And the way to get through them, the way to complete this purification, I'm not sure whether I can go back here, yes I can, uh, is to actually go back to what you were looking at before, the three signs. It's to actually recognize that these are also impermanent, that they can be dukkha in the sense of not getting what you want, yeah, being separated from what you want, those those things are dukkha. And that there's really what what is it that is being clung to? So by going back and applying insight to the practice, nothing wrong with having wonderful, happy, joyous practice, but just bear in mind it changes. It isn't satisfactory. It isn't somewhere you can stay. Yeah? The path involves the whole thing. And having got through that stage, you then move on to the fourth purification. I, uh, I think I translated it in the first, uh, that first one as knowing and seeing the path. Um, it isn't the word maga that's used here. And, it's some, and, I, and so I re rearranged it to knowing and seeing the means of reaching the goal. And this is where we get to strong insight and the eight knowledges and conformity. I'll move on. And there are the eight knowledges which come with this stage. Contemplation of rise and fall. That was something that just seeing the three signs, yeah, particularly a Nietzsche. Contemplation of dissolution. Uh, Mr. Cousins, who some of you will know, translated that as breaking up. Contemplation of breaking up, that things don't last. Interesting how that can come, that sense. Sometimes it can come to us. Maybe again in the practice when we've had that very pleasant state and it just falls away. And where was it? Where's it gone? Yeah? And there's some part of you that knows that things don't last. Things fall apart. Maybe in daily life, um, you know, the other day we were, we were attending uh, virtually the funeral of a friend who died recently. And that, that sense of things things falling apart. It's very strong. It comes very strongly. So these are not unattainable, high-level insights. Sometimes they can be quite mundane 
insights that all of us experience. In terms of the path, they can be developed. And the more that we're able to do them in balance with keeping good sealer and keeping the mind peaceful and settled, the more we're able to develop that. But in itself, maybe not so, uh, not so unattainable. The next one, appearance as terror, <laughs> sounds, uh, sounds pretty scary. Um, and contemplation of danger, uh, again, translated slightly differently as a sense of danger, a wretchedness, a <laughs> distaste, desire to be free. These are quite, uh, you know, some of them sound a bit unpleasant, actually. I remember reading these when I, uh, when I first looked at the book and thought, mm, not, not sure I want to do that. You know? <laughs> so, you know, do I have to sit there and see that everything is fearful and unpleasant? But again, if you start digging down into the text, it's not saying that uh, everything is fearful or that somehow at this stage you have to develop a sense of fear. But it's just actually seeing that there isn't really something that you can hang on to here. Yeah, We've seen that things fall apart. And so actually you suddenly realise that that could happen to any of this. Yeah? And we begin to see that this is, this is rather unsatisfactory. The first two seem to be related to Anicca, but these next four, I think, are related to clearly seeing Dukkha. Yeah? We know that there isn't something that can be hung on to. And so what do we want to hang on to? We're not satisfied by it. And interestingly, the fourth one of these is this one, this desire for deliverance, desire to be free. Because as part of this development of Panya, it isn't just about seeing the arising of phenomena as dangerous or terrifying in some way. It's also seeing the non-arising of those is blissful is safe that actually when you again when you go into the text you realize that there's a sort of balance here it isn't just about dwelling on things that are unpleasant it's also about having that balanced view of seeing that there is something pleasant which may be attainable we're getting this is close towards the end of the path but again i i think for all of us there may be a sense of how actually I've had a taste of that. That isn't, that isn't something far off and distant. I, I've had a taste of that where I've suddenly seen how things are in a certain way. And even if just for a moment, you can be free of it. And then we come on to this one, the contemplation of reflection. I rather like this translation, deep analysis. This is deep analysis. And this is really having seen that things come and go, that they are not something to be desired and wished for. You really just start to look carefully at what is going on. They talk about it in relation to the three signs. Um, so this deep analysis is, is seeing more deeply into Anicca, Dukkha. And anatta, and then interestingly, as a result of that and this desire to be free, coming to equanimity, we once again have equanimity at the end of a series, just like we do with the jhanas, like we do with the brahma viharas. It's there at the end of the path that having equanimity about formations is very close to the goal. Yeah? So the more we can keep coming back there, the more we can keep seeing clearly and settling that understanding, allow it to sink into the body through sila and the way we conduct ourselves in the world, the closer we come to the goal. 
because there's one more knowledge. They give eight inside knowledges here, and they say that when that equanimity is fully developed, we come to the triple gateway to liberation. And that simply means that at that point, we will be drawn to one of the three signs. Yeah? We'll see it more clearly than the others. And that will be the gateway to liberation. And then what arises is another knowledge, which is called conformity knowledge. And conformity knowledge is, um, you could say, is a kind of alignment. It's like things come together and they are aligned, they conform. Again, another interesting translation is tra translated by our friend Mr. Cousins as inflow. So it sort of almost has the sense, uh, like you get in Christianity, the sense of grace, something like that, inflow. Things are just aligned. There's nothing more to do. And it's saying that this knowledge, the effect of this knowledge, is to dispel the murk of the defilements. So this, this knowledge dispels the murk. It just clears everything away. Everything is in line. And we then move on. Uh, I need to go back here. We then go move on to the final purification, that of knowing and seeing. And the beginning of this is the change of lineage. And conformity, when things are aligned, the next thing that happens, this is all moment by moment, the next thing is change of lineage. And while conformity dispels the murk of defilements, change of lineage takes Nibbana as object. Change of lineage can't dispel the defilements. Conformity can't take Nibbana as object. But this is the moment of seeing Nibbana. It's the moment of the path. I think this is very interesting that this comes up, this notion of conformity and change of lineage because this also comes up in relation to jhana. This is the same jhana. In terms of jhana, they talk about it in terms of uh, preliminary work, clearing the ground, access, where things begin to settle, and then conformity and change of lineage moving into jhana. Exactly the same terminology is used where we've gone from equanimity about formations to the moment of the path. And for anybody who has doubts about whether they wish to go to the path, uh, I know I've certainly looked at things in the past and thought, oh, Nibbana sounds a bit boring. <laughs> <laughs> There's nothing much, nothing much goes on when you see Nibbana. You know, everything becomes a bit bland and colourless. There's a wonderful quotation which I'll finish with, which uh, is in the book. I'll just read it. So this final purification. This is talking about the path as it comes into being. It pierces and explodes the mass of greed, hate and delusion never pierced or exploded before. It also dries up the ocean of suffering of the round in the beginningless round of rebirths. It closes all doors to the state. All experience of the seven noble treasures. It abandons the eightfold wrong path. It allays all enmity and fear and it leads to the acquisition of many hundreds of other blessings. So I think on that note, I've got nothing more to say. <laughs> so I'll leave it there. Can you hear me saying thank you? 
um, wow, what a journey. <laughs> it was really so good that you helped us open that, that book, which is quite daunting. I don't think I've looked at it for a couple of years, but I was always dipping into it. But now you've made it accessible somehow. You know, only someone who's really gone into it can give the rest of us a way in, you know. And uh, and I'm not afraid of it anymore. <laughs> in fact, I want, to, I want to get to it as quickly as possible. Um, really, there were so many things in there that, that it set me thinking all sorts of things which I might come back to um, because um, we want to think about the next stage of our meeting now. So I, what would you like to do, Ian? I, I think, actually, let's just carry on. Okay. And if there are any uh, questions, I'll do my best to answer any questions. There may be other people who can help as well, I'm sure. Yeah. Uh, uh, the, I mean, I've missed out huge amounts of detail to try and give a... A bit of an overview but um, so uh, uh, I'm, yeah. I'm not sure this is the place to go we'll open it up to the, yeah. to, the, to the participants if you now's your chance it's just about 11 o'clock I think so we've got about a half hour for exploring in, in, in more depth I know I've got a question but I'm going to, to open it to everybody first Hi. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. Very, very interesting. Um, just going back actually to the beginning, I was very interested in the way that you retranslated purification. Mm. Um, I was very interested in many things, but that's the first thing that sort of comes to my mind. Um, and of course, brightening, you know, whatever in the voice, the one, the, the translation that you took up, and that's very samatha and really very satisfying, and we all like it very much. And it's, and of course it rings very true, etc. But going back to purification, why is it purification? Um, if things, if one comes to realize that things are as they are, and a kind of sense of acceptance of that, what, what is purification or what is purified or what, hmm. or what has been removed or what is, what is there that shouldn't be there? Something around that. Any hmm. thoughts about purification? I, I think, um, again, it's something to, it's interesting to go back to our experience because I think, uh, hopefully, for people who practice, it's something that they will experience from time to time. I'm sure you have had the experience that sometimes you've sat to practice and at the end of the practice, something is cleared away. It's just gone. There was something that was weighing on you or troubling you before the practice. At the end of the practice, it's gone. And I would say that's, uh, there's been a purification. So that on a, on a very simple level, I think it's something we often do. And I think most people who carry on with practice have that experience. Otherwise they don't carry on with practice if it doesn't, if it doesn't work like that. Sometimes um, it can be in terms of uh, some kind of insight as well, where suddenly you see something, maybe about something that you've done for years and years or it may be something about behavior you know where you just realize that something you've done at some time in the past may have harmed somebody rather than benefited them so for instance and just seeing that if you can see that and not attach to it and build it up into a big problem but just sort of settle with it often has the same feeling it's like it just takes a load off it just clears the way so i think purification is a very good uh, a good word i actually like this word brightening interestingly one of the things i did during lockdown it's one of those jobs that you just never do but we got some uh, silverware in our cutlery drawer and i got some uh, silver polish and I took all everything out of the cutlery. And it was just so satisfying, that kind of just clearing away. And, and we got the sparkly 
Britain, I think is, you know, it does have that sort of feeling of just kind of polishing something, you know, just gradually getting rid of the murk. You know, they talked about the murk of defilement. So I think all of these words, you know, we could have called it the splendid path or the excellent path or something like that. But I thought brightening has a quality, like I say, it doesn't sound quite as, um, I don't know, it sounds a bit worthy, doesn't it? Purifying and brightening sort of just appealed to me. Uh, does that answer your question? Yeah. 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 Rosie? Hello, hello Ian. Um, <laughs> I, <laughs> I, a, um, I was very quite, <laughs> I was quite taken by the list involving the dangers and things because you sort of, well, with just sort of every so often in different ways, I I realise I'm a bit of an all or nothing person and I get pulled up against myself. Oh, here you go again. Oh, I see that. Oh, what can I do about this? Oh, uh, right, where do I go? Go to the breath, go to this. And none of it quite ever works. And, and, that, and I'm not getting to the root of something. Is there a, that list was very helpful because I also, when I extended thinking about it, I thought it was a very good list for lockdown because... There have been a lot of us, I think, who've been brought up against yourself. If you've known somebody at ill, or if you've, you know, you've all the num numbers you've heard on the television or, and radio and things. Um, and I just wondered if you, there was a sense for you of, how, of work in progress, how, how you could use that list. Where do you go to when you see that the, I mean, in a sense, you talked about it, and maybe that's the answer. You go to the mind and sitting with it with equanimity and it will just drop away and you move to something else instead of dwelling on it as it were but i just wondered if there was a sense of how you could work with that mm. list mm. practically i think i think when it comes up um it might be fear and i'm, I'm sure some people sitting here will have experienced a sense of fear in practice or danger or something like that or something opening up and I think what what I found interesting in looking you know what digging down into the text is that they're often mentioned in relation to their opposite and so I think the way forward and again you just mentioned equanimity is that notion that arising this this coming into being is danger if it doesn't come into being that is safety so it's it's that kind of knowledge is sort of inherent in it it's like you know the dangers there you know there's something a bit fearful maybe something you don't really want to look at but you also have a sense of the possibility that it doesn't have to be like that. If you kind of latch onto it and that becomes all consuming, then it can be very unpleasant. But yeah, I mean, you mentioned about going back to the breath, going back to the body. Uh, I think if it comes up very strongly, then it's usually a good thing just to settle it and just kind of look in a slightly more measured way. But I think, I think it can develop in lots of different ways. And I think sometimes, uh, and I'm sure you know that sense of in which there's, the, there's something rather fearful present, but there's also something, you know, there's maybe dark there, but there's also a sense of the light as well, that that's part of it. And that's quite a, that's quite liberating it's purifying and and sort of leads onwards I, I'm not sure I'm, I'm not sure that was a very practical answer but <laughs> no actually it's it's uh, it's reacting to it and what comes to mind is reacting to it with mindfulness rather than yeah panic well and and you know yeah if if you panic then it it does all fall apart, doesn't it? You know, if you can just stay with it, uh, then and settle it, then it, it 
it can clear things away. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <coughs> but they, they do make a point um, that in this in this situation where they talked about appearance as terror, that they're not actually talking about, you know, you should develop fear. <laughs> it's not, this is not part of the path, but it's, it's just about recognizing it uh, and, and see that it's that, uh, it's that judgment, if you like, that if I go down this road, it's a really shaky road and it's not going to lead me anywhere. And I don't want to go down that road. <laughs> I don't want to go down that road. So you, you kind of keep centered in some way. Yeah. Charles, sure. Mm. Yeah. Thanks very much, Ian and Rosie. Um, I mean, it's perhaps, perhaps also worth bearing in mind that after the, the, the terror and so on comes dispassion and that's and maybe the the when it talks about terror it's not it's not talking about being as it were frightened of something in the the normal sense that i'm afraid of this or that or whatever but a sense of the sort of deepest um uh revulsion if you like it a kind of or a fear a, a, a deeper a sense of awareness of a kind of entrapment in things mm. yes. which, which is why it's followed the dispassion is about turning away that's what yeah. it's sometimes called and so it's that that combination of a sort of deep sense of mm. why will of not wanting something as it were and then turning away yes um, it's sort of like danger in the situation, yes, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it's yeah. the situation. Yes, yes, yes. It's, yes, it's just yes. not going to, <laughs> yeah. not going to lead to good, you know. So, yeah, yeah. And that turning away, I mean, it's they they translate it as you know distaste or dispassionate, but turning away is is equally a good translation. It is a is you know there is a just. A turn, uh, yeah, not, and I'm sure we can all think of things that maybe we we used to really like in the past, and things that we were really drawn to in the past, and that would may have a real hold over us. You know, you really were, you know, couldn't imagine carrying on without doing this or without having that. You know, and now you just kind of look at it and. You know that that's the sort of distaste. You know, you just sort of think, well, actually, I just don't want to go there. <laughs> you know, <laughs> no attraction. Hi, uh, thank you, Ian. Can you, you can hear me, yeah. Um, yes, I was. I was just really interested in the way you you presented this and the way in which those moments of practice, or indeed ordinary everyday life, I think you use the word pop up quite a lot, can can just appear and actually can link to potentially much further stages. Um, I suppose I'm interested in thinking about it because it would seem to me when those things happen, I might, for instance, recognize them as a particular seeing or understanding of something, but wouldn't, because I don't have the sort of the knowledge of the text in this way, see them in that particular context. And I'm just interested that whether in your own experience, whether you think it's valuable that one can both see something, but then actually reflect on it as to for instance, where it comes mm. in, in the particular list that you've given, mm. so almost at what stage that mm. might be and, and how that process might work. Mm. Um, I, think, I think I was suggesting in the talk that I do, I do think that's a useful thing to do. You know, that, that section that's given in the Visuddhimagga of the soil in which understanding grows, um, I think you know, you could say that's, that's the stage of looking at theory. I think it's very helpful to look at theory. I may not have sorted it out very clearly, but I think if you don't do that, you come up with theories anyway. We shouldn't, we shouldn't pretend to ourselves that we're not making theories about what practice is like. We do make, we come up with ideas. And sometimes you go back to what was said in a text and you think, oh, oh, 
oh, it's like that, <laughs> you know, and it sort of drops into place. Now, I'm, that isn't for a moment suggesting that you should kind of go around sort of ho trying to hold all this, you know, in in your mind. I mean, it would just be impossible. But I think the, I think I I see this the the path as uh, you could say go back right to the beginning it was talking about sila samadhi panya uh, and you could say body heart intellect or mind and i think it's that for the completion of the path you need all of those you, and you need a sense of where it's going and how it might be going obviously a lot of the time we get it wrong <laughs> you know we have ideas about this theory and that that's one of the things that i found so interesting when i came back to this it was only yesterday i had this realization that this book has almost been like a lifelong companion and it's almost like a symbol of the journey of practice because i've looked at it in so many different ways I've misunderstood so many things in it. And what's interesting is that I keep coming back to it and I keep finding something different in there or something that I couldn't make head or tail of when I first looked in the book suddenly sort of chimes in with experience. I wouldn't want to argue for a moment that you try and make your experience fit the model. Uh, because you have to remember, it is just a model. All the theories are just models, but they're models that are kind of pointing us and helping to guide us. And I think there's a sort of an interplay between practice, experience, and theory, which is, I, have, I, I think I would go so far as to say it's indispensable. <laughs> I know that may not be what everybody wants to hear, <laughs> but I think it's I think it's a fact. Like it. Uh, hi, uh, Ian. Uh, thank you for hi, the mate. talk. It was very uh, interesting. I had a question um, because I saw that equanimity is in the list of the defilements, yes. and also in the list of the inside knowledges. And I was wondering if it's like a different kind of equanimity, or if it's like a defilement, if it's equanimity plus attachment or yeah how that works no uh, well interestingly if it, going back to that first rendition of it when it's given as a defilement it's a defilement of insight it's not a defilement in itself and i i think i said at the time that all of these things are all very good and very helpful and i'm sure all of us will you know if you have a taste of equanimity you know how beneficial it is but like you said yeah it's the attachment to that if if you get attached to that if you get attached to the beauty and the joy and the bliss and the knowledge be careful about that word knowledge as well because it's a different word to the word understanding if you get attached to all of those things then I mean, we all do. <laughs> Let's not beat around the bush. We do. But what, what this is saying is, well, actually, that's not the path. The attachment to that, thinking that that is the way, that is not the way. It's part of the way. But the way to resolve that was actually also having that realization that these things, too, are a Nietzsche and dukkha and anatta and what it seems to be saying is that that leads to an even deeper equanimity that the equanimity that takes in the three signs as well is a, a deeper equanimity and is very close to the path does that answer yeah. the question yeah. okay. You mentioned, thank you very much, Ian, for, for, the, for the, uh, the talk. It was wonderful. And your comments on the book reminded me of a monk. For what? A monk who was taking a, a week's practice in Dublin. 
and he described the, the Sudi Maga as the most boring book he had ever read. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> well, 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 read it. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah. So what I wanted to ask you was about the uh, the three gateways you mentioned. Yeah. And is it more a question that you don't choose the gateway? The gateway chooses you. Yeah. Yeah. Is that the question? Yeah, that's the question. Yeah. I mean. We're all going hook again, hook. The reason I'm saying this is of one aspect, one of them keeps coming up all the time. That's 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 the direction you should be looking in. That's where you should be yeah. investigating. Yeah? yeah. I think the thing to bear in mind is that uh, at that moment before before the path, I mean, and this is just before the path, it is still conditioned. So there's conditioning involved. It isn't. It isn't just something that happened. I mean, you remember that after, the moment after, well, I'm not sure that the gateway is actually a moment. That, that's a technical thing I'd have to go and look back at, actually. Uh, but I think, you know, when that gateway arises, it's, it's like seeing the way out. Yeah, that is... A result of conditioning and that conditioning is comes from you <laughs> so you will have a predilection towards anicca or dukkha or anatta uh, you may not even realize it and it may be that at that moment you suddenly realize something that's been there all your life and you you'd never seen it before it's not necessarily that Oh, I'm a, I'm an Anicca kind of person, or I'm a an Anatta kind of person, you know, and I'll go for that gateway. I don't think it's like that. I think it will arise because it will be clear to you. There will be something clear to you at that point. But I, the interesting thing about all of these, it sort of sounds a bit far fetched, and it sort of sounds like this is off somewhere distant. But the point I was making before is that I think we come to all of these things in smaller ways, if you like, not in the sense of that final journey in the chariots, you know, from here to, to there where you get to the goal. You know, this is part of your exploration where you go and explore that bit of the journey before you do it. Uh, and uh, this sense of something suddenly opening may not be completely uh, something that you can't relate to that I think we can often relate to these things that may look like they're something far distant we can relate to those that we do have some experience that is rather like that and it may be that if you look back you you will recognize that maybe a particular tendency towards one of those but but the, it was interesting that, that Lance used that word inflow for conformity. And when he, when he used the word inflow, I just sort of thought, yeah, it's like you go to the gateway and then <laughs> that, that's, not, that's not really something, uh, not something that you can set up. Actually, I think it says that in the book that actually you can keep going back there over and over again. If you can't really settle the mind, you just have to keep going back there. You just keep going back there until you can. Thank you. Veronica? We've just got time, perhaps for one more, or... Um, I'd like to have the chance. I was going to say, is that your? <laughs> we have your... Is there somebody who'd really like to say and has been waiting, but I don't know whether there is. Okay. Um, yes, Ian, I think um, what I uh, got from the talk is like that perfect balance, you know, because how to integrate or use theory has always been a kind of challenge, especially for us who are teaching groups. We know it's there and the wisdom's there, but unless it really, really and truly relates to your lived experience, 
you know, it, it doesn't harmonize. But um, like you say, every now and then something will really click or something will confirm what you've experienced in, in the theory. You know, it will, it will resonate. Uh, and the path doesn't always go in linear stages. I was very much reminded that it's like an accumulation of, of continued off and on effort of some kind or another that is how it might work, you know, uh, that sort of steady continuation uh, rather than an, a kind of achievement of a certain stage. Something like that is our experience of the path. Mm. Um, but it, it, was, it is really helpful to be reminded how theory can, although it is abstract and structured, it, it, it has the, the recognition it gives to mm. you and the um, you know, sense of direction comes from the theory mm. sometimes, whereas we might feel a bit we're muddling around and just okay. continuing. So it's very, very well, good. I think the thing to bear in mind there is to go right back to the beginning, back to the purification of yeah. sila, the purification of conduct, because the theory is helpful if it affects the whole. So if it goes back to the body and becomes part of behavior and conduct, then it's very helpful. No question that you can go off on one with theory and lots of people do and I you know I've done that from time to time sometimes you can really go off on samatha you know and you just want that experience of practice and they're probably very useful at times but ultimately it's the integration of it all that's that's important and I think whenever you study anything it's really important that you then bring it down to earth. You bring it down to experience and you bring it kind of into the body as well. Otherwise, it, you know, it can be just hot air. So uh, you, you escape kind of the whole lot. So uh, we'll close it now. I'm back to you, Ian, how you'd like to close it. Well, shall we just have a blessing? Okay, yeah. A blessing. And actually, uh, we'll do two chants and the, and the first verse of the Bojanga Parita as well. Bhavatu sabba mangalang ra kantu sabba devata sabba buddha nu bhavena sada soti bhavantu te Bhavatu sabba mangalang ra kantu sabba devata sabba dhamma nu bhavena sada soti bhavantu te Bhavatu sabba mangalang ra kantu sabba devata sabba sanghanu bhavena sada soti bhavantu te Bojango sati sankato dhamma nang vichayo tata viriyam piti pasade bojanga chatata pare samadu peka bojanga sate te sabadasina munina samadakata bavita bahulikata sangvatanti abhinyaya nebana yachabodhiya Etena Sacha Vajena Sotite Hotu Sabada Sadu 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 Sadu